So, it is the expert team uh, is happy to host, and I'm personally really honored to introduce uh, the first ISOP lecture uh, held in Portugal as the final act of this two day conference, of the closing conference of project experts. And of course, I, I have to start this by expressing mine and the project and Marco's gratitude to ISOP, the Association of the European Schools of Planning, that has supported uh, us the possibility to invite our two speakers today for this final lecture. There should have been a representative from the ISOP Executive Committee who's not here, so I think I will have to spend a couple words on, on ISOP uh, myself. And maybe to start, well, for those who doesn't know it, ISOP is the Association of Peer Schools of Planning. It's one of the main uh, academic networks uh, in the field of planning and urban studies in Europe. It, it has both uh, a research and teaching scope. It's, it, it's a network of schools above all. It was born out of the idea of making, of creating a European uh, educational space for planning schools. And uh, well, ICS, the Institute of Social Sciences, is a member, an associate member of ISOP since three years, since 2016. And I mean, for me, this was, an, it's since I started my academic career, I've been involved in ISOP activities. And as a young academic, and this, I mean, I can take a moment for saying that, especially for PhD students, for people in the early stages of their career, uh, ISOP has a great supportive community with amazing uh, events. There is a yearly conference organized by the Young Academics Network. There is a yearly PhD workshop organized before the annual congress. Well, we have, we have because we launched uh, a, the journal of the Young Academics of Planning, which is called Planex. There is a blog, I mean, if you check on the website of ISOP, isopplanning.eu and the Young Academics, uh, you will find a lot of stuff. And among its projects, ISOP has launched some 10 years ago, this series of lectures whose goal is precisely to create a space for discussing topics which are crucial to our urbanized, urbanizing present in a space that, is, uh, that wants to be a meeting between academia and civil uh, society. So again, for us at ACS, for the Urban Transitions Hub, which is this recently created hub at ACS on urban and planning and urbanization topics, I would say, it is very important to host this, uh, this lecture. Here at ICS, we had already organized uh, events with the uh, uh, ISOP uh, Young Academics Network, but this is the first time an ISOP event is organized here at ICS. Well, maybe some of you know that in 2018, 2017, the ISOP Congress has been organized in Lisbon by three other schools, uh, the School of Geography and Spatial Planning they got, uh, by the Faculty of Architecture, and by the Institute Super Technic, or the Polytechnic Institute. Uh, and this is the first time we organize an ASOP event here at ICS, so I'm pretty happy. And actually, the first article that came out of Project Experts was published on the recently launched journal of ISOP, which is called Transactions of ISOP. There were some copies out there, but I think they were all taken, so good for us. And so, uh, I will move to introducing the lecture and our speakers. Uh, this conference was organized in a way of going up in, in, in scale. We started yesterday afternoon with presenting the results of the project, which are mainly regional, metropolitan, the pair in, in Lisbon, and to some extent at the national level. Before this session, we had, uh, I think, an amazing round table on national housing policies in Portugal. And already in that roundtable, it, it, um, it kept emerging the fact that the problems that we have here are very much local, very much national, but are definitely linked with global processes, trends, and problems and issues, which I think are going to be much at the core of the first of our lectures. And on the other hand, that if we are hard to find solutions to the present housing crisis, past and present housing crisis, it's not just enough to work at the local and national level, but there needs, 
there is a need to working out things that happen, for instance, in Europe at the European unity, uh, Union level, which is responsible for many regulations that shape, for instance, the capacity of municipalities or not to regulate things like Airbnb, which are really linked, and more generally to regulate financialization, funds, uh, speculation investments in the housing field and in the real estate more generally. And so this is precisely why we decided to invite two speakers with very different paths, with very different not maybe perspectives, but that have looked at the same thing, the problems of the present of urbanization, from quite different perspectives and with very different uh, career paths at the same time. And we really hope that these two perspectives are going to be pretty much complementary and allow us to have a broad discussion on the sopra local scale of the problems. So the lecture will be opened by Manuel Albers, is an associate professor of social economic geography at KU11 and the coordinator of the Real Estate Financial Complex Research Project. Manuel has already had many positions, University of Amsterdam, Columbia University, and being guest researcher at New York University, City University of New York, Milano Bicocca, and Urbino in Italy. And yeah, he's interested in the intersection of real estate, finance, and states, and probably you all know his book, The Financialization of Housing. Well. Manuel is also author of, a, of an article uh, which title is Centering Housing in Political Economy, which was translated and closes the special issue of Cidades, Comunidades, Territorio, which we have published as part of Experts Project. And so I would really suggest you to take a look at that paper, which really centers housing within broader processes. And then our second speaker is Ivan Tosic, Managing Director of the Metropolitan Research Institute in Budapest. His interests span from urban sociology to strategic development, from housing policy to EU regional policy issues. Well, importantly, Ivan is one of those who has been able to associate an academic career. He teaches at the University of Pax, the Department of Political Studies, and is policy editor of the journal Urban Research and Practice, with a wide-ranging policy and consultancy and lobbying and activist and political activity. For instance, he has been for two times in 2011 and then recently in 2019 appointed as one of the thematic program expert for the European program Urbact. And I mean, he has been part of the European Union agenda for housing, which has been recently concluded. So if there's someone who knows how things have been going on related to housing and planning in the European Union, he's one of those. Well, so the plan is we're going to have two lectures. I've asked them to stay in the 40 minutes, so we will have plenty of time for discussion. There will be a short wrap-up by Marco, but I saw that Paolo Silva from ISOP just arrived. Thank you very much for being here. So just before the lectures, Paolo, if you want to spend... I said beautiful things about ISOP, but I would like you to adapt something, <laughs> would you? First of all, good afternoon to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, welcome you on behalf of ESOP. Uh, this has been a tradition, uh, these ESOP lectures for the last seven years. And uh, it has been um, a very fulfilling uh, kind of event because it, it combines very well, or complements very well all the, all the other annual events we have. And uh, in particular this year to be very rich with one of the three uh, ESOP lectures for this uh, uh, for 2019, and this uh, the topic of today is particularly challenging, and particularly challenging also in the context, not just a European level, but also Portuguese-wise, it's a very uh, very relevant one. So, I'm very pleased to be here, and on behalf of the Executive Committee of ESOP, and on behalf of uh, the ESOP community, I would thank and welcome our guests and I will not take more time and before finishing, I'm sorry for the, for the delay due to the, to the bad weather and a little bit of difficulty on finding the site, but it's okay. Uh, thank you very much. So, 
No further ado, uh, Manuel, the floor is yours. Yeah. This is working. Okay, uh, Simone, thank you very much for the invite, also for the introduction, and thank you even more for taking the initiative to um, translate one of my papers. It's an honor to be invited for a lecture, but I think it's even a greater honor to have an article translated in another language, actually. That happens actually much less often. Um, in the introduction, Simone already said a little bit what I'm talking about. In the online introduction, in the invite, it says that I'm going to talk about housing a lot. Actually, I'm not going to talk about housing much. I'm going to mostly talk about other aspects of financialization in the city, uh, which include urban planning, land use, real estate, and the role of municipalities in this process. So not too much about housing. If you want to know more about housing, you can look up the book. Uh, I also feel that I've been doing the housing talk quite a lot now. So there will be many people who know it. Yvonne, for sure, because in the last three months, we see each other once a month. We, we go to the same event, so as you said, we have a somewhat different profile, but uh, we intersect regularly, and in 2005 we even co-authored a book chapter together, so there is some uh, history here also. Okay, I'd like to start with examples rather than with theory. Do you know this company? What do they make? Okay, what else do they make? Calendars, yes, there's always someone saying calendars. <laughs> I've never had it in an audience where three or four people at the same time say calendars. You see it's one person, three out of four times it's a male. Um, but this is interesting, many people know calendars. Uh, yes, they make tires, they make calendars, but they mostly do real estate. This is a real estate company that also happens to make tires, and to sell the tires they also have calendars. But this is primarily a real estate company, although um, this is also changing already as we speak. Uh, Pirelli, of course, is known for their tires, uh, and the white thing you, f you see here, I think it's called an incinerator in English, but don't quote me on this. Uh, this used to be part of their original factory in the city of Milan, towards the north of the city. Um, and what basically happened, most of the activities of Pirelli, most of the factories were moved away from Italy. Italian labor was too expensive, you all know what happened in the 70s and early 80s in many European countries. Um, and what basically happens around this site, um, where the factory used to be, the land has been taken over by the city and by, the, and by a university. The university is called the University of Milan Bicocca. So the University of Milan was a very big university, as universities in Italy tend to be. It's basically, they decided not to do a, a Milan number two university, but have a, a completely separate university called Milano Bicocca. And they built it on the site of the Pirelli factory. So where this site used to be a huge brownfield in a not very attractive part of the city of Milan, uh, it actually became a very highly valorized piece of land because it was the biggest piece of land within the city limits of Milan that could be redeveloped. So now we have there a big university, we have housing, we have offices, we have a mall, and there's an office of Pirelli, which is this building, built around the incinerator. So in a way, this was Phoenix rising from the ashes, uh, Pirelli, although as a tire company was not necessarily doing bad, locally in Italy it wasn't doing too much anymore. But in Italy people now know Pirelli either through its network of real estate agents, or as a real estate developer, or as a manager of the real estate owned by others. And you can still see some of the same letters of Pirelli in here. This has become an independent company, Prelios, that manages some of the housing, sorry, some of the office buildings owned by the Pirelli holding, although it's put in a different company within the holding. But it's an independent company itself, uh, Prelios, so it manages the housing that's owned by Pirelli, but it's a separate company that also manages housing and offices for other companies, to make it even more complicated. I, I take this example because many companies that we think of as being part of the fourthest aid of the industrialization that make products uh, are actually either real estate companies or financial companies. I can also tell a story about General Motors, uh, which is actually a financial institution that happens to make cars. Uh, so I don't think it's actually a coincidence that the one makes tires, the other one make, makes cars, but there's many other examples like this. 
So this is just an example to start with. I will move on with another example from Italy. I will use examples from Italy and Brazil. I thought uh, I could pick from, from many different countries, but I thought I'd pick one in a, you could say, in a context somewhat similar to Portugal, uh, Italy. I don't have any work on Portugal to present, unfortunately. And I thought I'll pick some work from a non-European context and maybe I'll pick one where maybe a Portuguese audience might know a little bit more about because of the language. Uh, if there's time, but I'm pretty sure there won't be, I will also tell something about a context that I'm personally from. I'm now working in Belgium, but I'm originally from the Netherlands. So I may also give you an example of a small city in the Netherlands, but probably I won't because Simona will have told me that I need to go to my conclusions. Um, so this is a map of Milan and the area around it. Oh, I had to put this on, right? Yeah. So you see here the city limits, the city border. And the Bicocca site is here. You see all the other big projects. The city of Milan is not a massive city within the municipality, 1.4 million people, but a lot of big projects. They have as many big projects as some cities that are three, four times as large. Uh, the city of Milan also has a tradition of doing a lot of planning through these big projects. Uh, there's other cities who do this as well, but I think Milan might be some of like an ideal type of cities that do planning through big projects. Um, and in generally, we can have a lot of criticism how the project turns out, who's included and who's not. But if you look from the goals of the municipality, what they want to accomplish, they usually do quite well. Within Italy also, the planning department in Milan is known to be relatively well run, relatively professional, efficient. Again, we can have all kinds of critique about the outcomes, but um, they, they know how to do these projects in, to a certain degree. What I'm actually going to look at now is not the city of Milan, but is here the Sisto of Sesto San Giovanni. You see the name here abbreviated. A much smaller city in the industrial fringe, uh, the red zone around the city of Milan, which was the industrial belt, mostly to the north and partly to the e east. Um, but it's now become a, a belt. Um, it's called the Red Belt, of course, obviously, because people would vote for the Communist Party or the Socialist Party. But it's now become a belt of many brownfields. And again, not a very attractive site. And generally, the north of Milan is not so attractive. Sesto San Giovanni um, is, is quite unpleasant to look at as a town. Um, the density of the housing is, is very high. Um, in between the housing estates, there are large brownfields. And the one here I will look at in white is the Falk site. And you see it's actually not one site, but it's three nearby sites, which used to be a steel factory. Um, and that steel factory I looked at with an Italian colleague, Federico Zaffini, when we were still based in Amsterdam, when both of us were based in Amsterdam, he still is. He came to me and he said, uh, I'm doing this PhD on the big projects in Milan, Paris, and Amsterdam, and I think in Milan there's something interesting going on. Uh, could, we look at in this, could we look at it together? So that's what we did. He was mostly interested in the planning aspects. I was very interested in the finance. So he said, let's look at the finance together and see what's going on there. So that's what we did. Uh, don't try to read the whole table yet. I will go through it step by step. Um, so first, we see the years here. Um, from 1919, the steel factory closes, and until the year 2000, the Fell Corporation owns the site. Um, they basically um, wait with the land. They don't have the idea that they can do much with the land. As I said, it's on the unattractive side of Milan. There are many brownfields in the same site, either within the city limits of Milan or outside. Um, so the, the original program was high-end industrial activities, small-scale manufacturing as well. And there were no expected gains on investment, not defined, because this was a factory closing. So for 10 years, there was a brownfield, not even that long. And then in the year 2000, they sell the land to um, a local real estate investor known as Grupo Passini. So actually not one person, but a number of local real estate investors. So the local is important here as well. Um, they come up with an idea to redevelop the land uh, and make it into a big project, 730,000 square meters. For those of you who are interested, the floor area ratio is here as well. Uh, and what they do is they want to make 9% profit on redeveloping this site. And they do this by uh, buying the land for 140 million euros. It's a massive site. That's also one of the reasons why it was not so easy to redevelop. But interestingly enough, they get 200 million to actually buy the land. So this already shows something about how, how land works in the present day economy. Their financial model was actually quite basic. Uh, otherwise, it's bank loans, uh, equity, 
Uh, it's not a very complicated model, uh, but what we cannot prove, but what we know uh, quite well, uh, but we can't put it black and white, is that they never plan to do any redevelopment of the site. Their only plan was to lobby the city of, the city of Sesto San Giovanni and ask them to rezone the land so the land would increase in value so they could resell the land to another user, right? So this is exactly what they did. This took a few years. Uh, and in 2005, they sold it to Grupo Sonino Holding, which is again a group of investors, not only in real estate. This is already a wider group. They do real estate as well as other things. And they don't come necessarily from the Milan area. They come from throughout Italy. So we see already a rescaling also taking place with the investment. Uh, they pay 298 million for the land. So the land price doubles in just five years. The land is still exactly the same, right? Um, because they paid so much for the land, and they actually pay part of it with their own money, 88 million they actually put in, in their own money, the rest they borrow as well. But because they pay so much for the land, they have to make a bigger project. So they do 1.1 uh, square meters. And then you can imagine, in 2005, uh, the, you know, the, People thought like anything is possible. You can do real estate anywhere. You can make profits. So they, you can just write down a number and you know, people would think it would work. So they said, we're going to make 15% profit here. Then of course, 2008 happens, the crisis hits, um, which in Italy wasn't a fast crisis, was basically a, a slow burning crisis, has taken years. Um, but then you see, of course, it's not so easy anymore to realize 15% profit. So when they sell the land again, the next investor is expecting to make 12% profit, but this is still in 2010. So Italy is still in the middle of the crisis. They still expect to make double digit uh, profit. But the other interesting thing is, even after the crisis, the land gets still sold for more money. It's sold for more than 400 million euros now. So even though the profits go down, and also the programming goes down a little bit of what they plan to do there. Uh, and we see here, at this moment, it's Bitsi and Partners uh, holding that buys the land, which is a a holding registered in Italy, but most of the investors behind the holding are international. So we see another rescaling happening uh, where another level goes up in a way of the investors in the land. We also try to summarize the financial model here. I'm not going to try to explain this because I will run out of my 40 minutes really fast. But basically they use a very complicated financial model. That's the short version of it. Uh, and you can also see here already it becomes more complicated. Once you see SPVs, it usually means there's more complicated financial tricks involved. And SPV means a special purpose vehicle. And although that sounds very obscure, it's exactly what it is. It's a special purpose vehicle, meaning a specific company that is legally a different entity that's often just used as a way station either uh, to do complicated financial deals or to evade taxes, usually both. Um, and what happened after we published the paper 2016, the land was sold again, now to a group of investors, mostly from the Middle East. They again paid more for the land, uh, and they now actually plan to do a big project there. As I said, we're pretty sure, oh, we're pretty sure that this first investor never tried to do anything. Here we're not sure. These actually tried to make a plan that looked like they might actually be planning to do something, but they weren't able to pull it off, and they had to resell again. So what we see here through one example, which I like to use because I think it shows a lot of things just in one site, is that the planning process at the local level and the investor and financial logics at other scales are completely becoming detached. It's not just that the scale is different, it's also the interests that are there. What also happens that I haven't said much about yet, this is not the city of Milan, as I mentioned, this is the city of Sesto, a city of around 70 or 75,000 people. Not very well run. The planning department is not very professional. They don't know how to do big plans themselves. So if an investor comes to them, they basically accommodate and they say like, yes, we will do this. Yes, we will do this. So anytime the investor wants something else, they will rezone the land because they are just desperate to have anyone fill some of the big brown fields in their municipality because they have several. So they don't take the lead themselves. They don't have the capacity to do that. So all they do is just facilitate to make sure something will happen. They don't demand much. They don't say like, oh, we need affordable housing because this is a relatively low income community. They don't say anything about other facilities they want. They more or less just let it happen. So it's not just that the investors are responsible for this. The city planning departments and city hall are as much responsible for this as well because they let it go in a certain extent. What is interesting here is that land, in a way, has become what Phil O'Neill, Australian geographer, calls an arterial route in the circulation of finance. And you see the land itself is being used to make money. 
Um, David Harvey in the late 70s and 80s used to argue that capital is flowing onto and through the land and that capital is in a way a place to park your money and then move on. But actually we go one step beyond Harvey these days. The land is increasingly used as collateral, meaning something you can borrow money with to invest elsewhere. And the clearest example, the easiest example uh, you can see with the, with the the investor here that actually borrows more uh, money, meaning they can buy the land with this, but by buying the land, by getting a bigger loan, they also can invest somewhere else. And they might be able to do the same trick again. So you can increase within, within a few of these land deals, you can increase the amount of money that goes uh, through your organization. Uh, so another way to put this, uh, land is no longer just a fix for over accumulation somewhere else. You, many of you may be familiar with David Harvey's idea of the spatial fix. It is mobilized to create leverage, in other words, to borrow money uh, in a higher amount than the money you have yourself, to create credit and then to seek profitable investment elsewhere. This has become the role of the land. And of course, I'm just uh, using one example here rather than giving a whole overview, so don't take my word for it. <laughs> Study it yourself. Uh, but I think this case, although it may be extreme in some way, um, is exemplary of how the current real estate and financialized uh, economy works. So, now that I have two examples from Italy, I like to go a little bit to uh, some definitions and things like that. What do I mean with financialization? I didn't want to start with that because then people fall asleep before I get to all the interesting cases. So this is my definition. The increasing dominance of financial actors, markets, practices, measurements, and narratives at various scales resulting in a structural transformation of economies, firms, including financial institutions, states, and households. So I can imagine this is a bit much. This is why I didn't put it at the beginning. Um, but many people will say, like, well, one of the problems with financialization is it's trying to do too much. It's a too complex process. It's trying to cover a lot of different grounds. That's absolutely true. In that sense, it can be a chaotic concept. I totally accept that critique. But why I think it is important to discuss this under the banner of financialization, although I'm very happy if people use other, other labels, is that all these different things are actually connected. The financialization of households is related to the financialization of the state, which is related to the financialization of urban planning, which is related to things happening at different scales. So if we say, if we're gonna talk about national economies, we use a different term than when we talk about households. And again, we use a different term when we talk about the state, and we use a different term when we talk about specific firms. I think we're actually separating, putting walls in our conceptual thinking of things that are actually all belonging together. It doesn't mean they're all exactly the same, it means they belong together and our tendencies, uh, sorry, our uh, uh, characteristics of the same tendencies. Uh, of course, it means that you can't just empirically use this. You need an operational definition, so or an empirical definition, as I put it up here. So you can pick elements, basically, and say, like, I will look at the increasing dominance of practices, financial practices, at one particular scale and how this affects one particular actor. This is one way to do it. Um, so I'm not saying you can research this as it is here. Um, and there's many forms of financialization, so I'm, I'm well on board with everything. One of the other complicating factors is here, uh, that financialization is sometimes the exponentum, that is the thing to be explained. And in some other studies of financialization, it's the exponent, the thing that explains. So that makes it also a little bit more confusing. And this is again a valid critique um, of this concept. I haven't seen it phrased, the critique, in that way, but this is how I have phrased my uh, defense before the critique was there. Because the critique, in a way, is actually not that clear in, in what, what, does, what it doesn't like about the concept. But I think this is part of the confusion. And this is very normal for these type of big concepts. Think of globalization, neoliberalization, whenever people use those terms, always think about, is it the thing to be explained or the thing that explains something else? And it's not always clear. And even when it's clear, it can be the one thing, and then a few minutes later, it becomes the other thing. Uh, and again, like globalization, neoliberalization, we try to address this at different types of factors, different scales. We don't just speak about globalization as the global, which is far and abstract. We speak of the globalization of specific places. So also there, we look at different scales with this kind of uh, concept. So financialization, in that sense, is not unique. Um, and although it has all these problems, I think uh, it would be problematic to not use terms like globalization, neoliberalization, and financialization, because we will need so many words each time to explain what we mean and say like, oh, we're actually talking about the same thing. You call it this, I call it that, but we actually talk about one thing. So the fact that we need these kind of complex 
concepts that try to do too many things at the same time. This reflects the nonlinear, multidimensional, multiscalar nature of contemporary societies and economies. I could also talk about that for 40 minutes, but I'm not going to do that either. So now I go to Brazil, um, and I will talk about a program, a policy program, a policy framework known as Urban Operations, Brasalas Urbanas, um, which is a policy framework that basically creates a space of exception for large-scale redevelopment projects. This is very common. Uh, the people here who study planning or, or are trained as planners will know that it's very common when you do a big project, uh, you often come up with some specific regulation for it, and that regulation is different from the regulation you apply to smaller scale projects which go through the normal planning laws or land use, land use laws or whatever regulation is in place. This is not unique to Brazil, this happens around the world. Uh, most countries have something like this where the big projects are put in a different type of regulation, often not entirely under democratic control, uh, and Brazil does something like this as well. Um, there's also studies by Brazilians that show um, how this has come about um, and, and how it happens in the Brazilian way. And there's, there's many people who wrote about this in a more general sense. Edix Vinkadao uh, is one of them, Frank Mullard, they've written a, a book about this, about this, this, this idea of these big projects being outside the normal scope um, of democratic planning. Um, I want to look at one particular instrument that is used within these urban operations, the CPAC. Uh, CIPACH, uh, which is a certificate for additional building rights. I'm going to explain it through some graphs on the next slide. So if you don't know yet what it is, I hopefully it will become clear in the next few minutes. This is basically a tradable financial product. Uh, what happens is that this is something you can buy. You can buy a CPAC as a financial product, and buying this financial product gives you the rights to develop more than the zoning for an area allows you to do. These CPACs can only be bought for uh, redevelopment areas within these urban operations. So the urban operations define certain areas within the city where big projects will take place. There's only a couple of them throughout Brazil. Uh, and only within those areas you can apply the CPAC. Uh, now comes one of the possibly most interesting things of it. Let's say I'm a developer. I buy the land because I want to re redevelop the land. Um, Simone, on the other hand, is an investor. He buys the CPAC. So this means that he now has bought the rights to develop on top of the land that I own. So this either means I have to buy the product from him or we have to cooperate. In practice, the second happens a lot. What also happens, of course, developers buy it themselves. So this is still the easy version. For those who are familiar with the idea of tax incre increment financing, which comes from the US, but is now increasingly popular also in the UK. It's very similar. For those of you who are not familiar with tax increment financing, forget about it directly, um, because otherwise it would just be another example to explain. So, Orizzi, there were just a few of these sites, a couple in Sao Paulo and one in Rio de Janeiro, but the one site in Rio de Janeiro where this could take place was bigger than the couple in Sao Paulo combined. Um, and nowadays there are new sites in Curitiba, uh, and new ones in Sao Paulo and in Rio de Janeiro, metropolitan area, Niterói, for instance, now has one as well. Uh, but I will talk about the ones in Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. And here I'll try to explain it a little bit more graphically what's going on. Uh, maybe I'll need my pointer again. Um, so, because I think it is quite complicated, it helps us basically say it twice slightly differently. So the state, and in this case it's complicated because in Rio, the land is owned by federal and quasi-federal institutions. The planning power is with the local authority, who then has a private office erected purely by the municipality, but the planning is done by a privately uh, run office staffed by people from the city. Also very common for big projects. So the state in this case is primarily the local states, but it becomes more complicated. Um, so what they can do is they can just print the CPACs and they can basically make money out of nowhere. This is part of the beauty of it. And especially in a case where taxing is difficult, you can imagine if you can just sell additional uh, land development rights, you don't have to buy them because as a city you create them. So the existing zoning already allows developers to do something. If you say the existing zoning allows you to do this blue building, through the CPAC you can do, in this case, three extra floors. Oh. Wrong button. Um, 
allows you to do three extra floors. So this means that the city can ask money for this without the city having to do much with the money themselves. So this is one of the great things which potentially is using a financial product for the benefit of the city at large. Uh, so they sell the CPAC, for instance, to a developer, could be an investor, uh, and the developer or the investor then pays money to the state, and then the agreement is within these CPACs currently, this money has to be used for infrastructure investment in the area, which also means that the local states, in theory, can be investing in infrastructure without using tax money for it. They can use the money that is made through the development. It's basically a, a type of land value capture. So they can use that money and then put it in the infrastructure in the area. And the, the argument is we don't need to use taxes for this. Uh, and for the developer, this is nice because they know that the infrastructure will have to be created because they actually pay money for it. So the more they actually pay for the CPAC, the more they will be going into infrastructure. Which also means you can already finance the infrastructure before the development takes place because you need to buy the CPEC before you can start developing, right? So timing-wise, it's also interesting. It solves another problem that the city doesn't have the money yet to invest in infrastructure because they need to make money on taxes. In this case, this is not a problem. This is how it's similar as tax increments financing. So it uses all kinds of loops and tricks, either within the planning regulations or special things that are happening through this law for the urban operation. Um, but actually the program used to be much better. In the 1970s, they already had something similar. Uh, it was also used uh, in the same way. You could get some extra volume, you could develop it. It was not sold as a financial product, but it was sold basically as a contract um, between the developer um, and the city. And then the money went into a city fund and that uh, money was actually redistributed for other investments. So some of the sanitation and some of the favelas was actually done in the 1970s through that fund. So in the 1970s, it was an amazing fund. You used the places in the city where you can make most money. And uh, you used that extra money coming in, not through taxes, but by giving developers additional rights. So they, they have a choice to pay for it. And then putting it in the city fund and moving it to the peripheries of the city and investing there. In the 1990s, with the introduction of the urban operation, the money had to stay within the perimeters of the site. So potentially, it's still a quite nice program because the investment in the area doesn't have to be paid from tax money, but it's not as nice as it used to be where the money is actually redistributed to poorer places. Uh, so these are some of the supposed advantages of CPACs. I already mentioned quite some of them. You have upfront resources. Uh, no government investment is needed because the government sells them uh, doesn't have to put money in, it gets the money. Oddly, it's often mentioned that comp competitive bidding itself is a, an advantage of using this instrument, which we would say might be a bit odd, but for mainstream economists, the effect that it's competitive would be good in itself. Uh, then they say there's a positive uh, investment feedback loop. Once you get investment in the land and real estate, uh, if, if that is worth more, there will be more investment in infrastructure, which means that new CPACs and are given out in trenches, uh, can also be sold for more. It's a quite effective way to do land value capture, something which is now heavily studied in planning and in urban economics. Uh, and another argument is that this leads to transparent urban governance and to investor protection. And many of these are problematic, but definitely the last one. So the reality, actually the government still, uh, still invests. The money that we make to the CPACs is not enough to pay for all the new infrastructure. So actually tax money still goes from basically the city at large into um, the most high potential areas within the city. Also, there's an excessive focus on infrastructure. All the money goes into infrastructure. No money goes into social housing. There's no spatial distribution taking place anymore. Uh, typically, the CPACs are sold under the market price, so the competitive bid bidding doesn't really work, probably because a lot of the developers agree with each other uh, how many they're going to buy. Um, so in the it's a de facto subsidy to the developers in this, in this way. Um, the idea was you have a financial product so you can resell it. Uh, if Simona buys it, he can sell it to me as a developer, he can sell it to any of you. That idea, of course, to mainstream economists by itself is good, that you have a, an open competitive market again. It doesn't work like that at all. Typically, there's only one seller involved and either that seller develops or they get into a partnership with someone who can develop. The other thing is that actually what is here mentioned as transparent urban governance, it's actually the opposite because you get uh, privatized government 
uh, where the city planning office, as I mentioned, has a specific privatized uh, office running this. And the other issue is that in many of these areas you get gentrification and displacement. Specifically in Rio de Janeiro, it becomes even more complicated, uh, which is, and it's because all of the CPACs were bought up by one single institution, the FGTS, uh, which is one of the most interesting institutions in Brazil. I, I'm sure many, some of you may know about it. It's on the one hand a compulsory savings account system, basically a pension fund in lieu of having a, a real pension fund. Uh, where uh, employer contributions come in rather than, than tax income. Uh, it's used for social security. You can take money out of the funds of your personal account if you want to buy a house, but you can also use it if you have large uh, healthcare bills to pay for. In effect, the FDGS has become a massive investor and one of the largest stock owners uh, in Brazil. It's also by far the, the biggest mortgage lender in Brazil, and it is a massive land and property developer. Uh, so they do many different things, and again, there's an institution somewhere else that is somewhat similar. This, this case in Singapore, the Singapore Central Provident Fund, so in a completely different context, is an institution that does more, more or less the same things as, as the FDTS. This is what uh, the site in Rio de Janeiro used to look uh, like before Porto Maravilla, in case you know of the site, so uh, mostly a port area. The original favela that named all the other favelas was located here and then was renamed uh, because it became the sword name for all the favelas. This is what it used to look like. This is what they wanted to look like. And uh, Rio de Janeiro puts a lot of money into uh, public transport. So again, they, they do also quite some nice things with it. Uh, a tram network that you can see here, quite elaborate. Uh, cable cars connecting the hills, which any city doing a big plan in Latin America seems to do. And uh, they don't put a lot of money in car infrastructure. Uh, and this is what it's going to look like. There was going to be a Trump Tower. The Trump Tower is probably cancelled. Many of the projects now are being cancelled because uh, of the economic situation in Brazil. Of course, there's also going to be a museum. Uh, with a big project, we always need a museum. There's no social housing requirements. And of course, they, they use the typical of the architect. So we see Sahata Dietz designed the project there, for instance. And you see a combination of you know, some more interesting looking projects of some of the more standard towers that you will see everywhere. In Sao Paulo, on the other hand, it's in a way even worse. Basically, um, they put mostly towers like this in, and they put almost all the money in car infrastructure. So although you could say in Rio de Janeiro they could have done a better job by actually making sure there could be social housing or by redistributing some of the money, the case in Sao Paulo is worse because uh, they don't do any of those things either. Plus, they don't put a lot of money into public transport. It's the like cars, cars, and bridges for cars. Um, how many minutes? Simona? Uh, eight. Eight. Okay, I will do the Netherlands very briefly and then I'll go to the, con to the conclusions, if that's okay. Yeah? Um, so the Netherlands is, is again a very different case. Uh, and it's, a, it's a country of strong fiscal centralization at the national level, strong urban planning tradition, and formally you could say a textbook of urban managerialism. Um, and very important, a lot of the, the land development was done by public <coughs> land banks, municipal land banks, that were part of the city government, are still part of the city government, and that have a lot of power and actually um, are able to get a certain level of quality, which as Dutch people we usually complain about, but then we go to new built areas abroad and they're usually even worse. Um, so they're relatively well able to, to bring facilities to these areas, also make sure that all of these areas have 30% social housing. So in many ways, not a perfect model, but better than uh, things we're used to. But the municipalities have a double role here. On the one hand, they are the planning agencies. They do the rezoning, they facilitate development, and they are an investor in the land through the municipal land bank, which are always two separate entities within each municipality. But there's no rule that says they can't talk. So they cooperate a lot, and they coordinate, which makes sense. Um, but yeah, this means the municipality always has two roles. What started to happen, this model basically came out of a social democratic welfare state, where the idea was if we have the municipal land bank, we can make sure we get the right quality, we get affordable housing, etc., etc. What happened basically from the late 80s onwards, but mostly in the mid and late 1990s, the responsibilities of a lot of these things were decentralized, where in the past the national government would assign uh, big new urbanization sites. It became much more the cities themselves. The taxes didn't entirely follow. So what we see in many places, municipalities have to do more work, don't get more taxes to do it, so they have to find other ways to get the money in. 
So within urban planning at the same time, we see much more focus on competitiveness and less on social democracy. These municipal land banks uh, start buying land from and also selling to developers. So it's very common in land to have what sometimes is known in English as a land claim model. Basically, the municipality forces all the developers to put all the money into the municipal land bank. And they say, if you have 20% of the site, you can, at the end, get 20% back. If, you, if a developer doesn't want to cooperate, uh, if it's a sneaky city, like the city of The Hague, had one big developer didn't want to cooperate on 20 to 25 percent of the land of a new big development, the city of The Hague said, if you don't want to put the money in our land bank and then buy it back from us some years later after we service the land, we're going to plan the park exactly where you own the land. In other words, they can't make any money on the development. So this is some of the ways, especially big cities, force the developers to go with their plans so the developers are not able to execute their own plans entirely. They have a little bit of freedom, but most of it is done, especially in the big cities, by uh, how they want to see it developed. Um, but what started the municipal land banks basically started to finance a lot of these prestigious buildings, so museums, uh, sports stadia, etc., etc. This model worked quite well in the late 1990s, early 2000s as well, up to the crisis 2008. Uh, they invested 3.2 billion euros in these kind of prestigious buildings just in five years' time was very successful because the prices of land and real estate went up in those years. <laughs> then the crisis came uh, and the developer said, okay, we don't want to buy back the land anymore. We have the right to buy back the land from you. Well, why would we do it? Like, no one wants to buy a house now. No one can get a mortgage. We're not going to do this. Although the Netherlands, economically speaking, wasn't hit too hard by the financial crisis, housing prices went down uh, by 20% if you correct for inflation. So. Although the land is not a typical case like many southern European countries or Ireland or Iceland, it was hard hit. The housing market was very hard hit. And uh, at some points, uh, more than half of the households in the lands were underwater, meaning the value of their mortgage loan was bigger than the current housing prices. Um, so what happened, a lot of these municipalities have undeveloped land, which again amounted to 3.2 uh, billion euros, exactly the same amount, and again in five years' time. So you can see the impact also of the crisis here. And a lot of these municipalities get under national supervision have to implement austerity policies. Very briefly, one example, the city of Apeldoorn, in a city of 160, 170,000 people, they did this quite specifically. And I'm not going to explain it in detail because I'm running out of time. But their land holdings went up from 88 million in 1999 up to 235 in 2009. So in 10 years' time, their land holdings almost tripled. And again, this is not a big city, this is a city of 160 or 170,000 people. So I think already 88 million is probably a lot. One of the things they did is they're in a region with three smaller cities all around the same size. They thought our location uh, within that region is the best, so we're going to develop all the offices and all the companies uh, are going to come to our city, and therefore we need to buy all the land uh, because they won't go to the other cities. Also, housing-wise, they expected more people would want to live in their city than in the other ones, which was actually partly true for some years. But they bought way too much land, and the developer said, no, thank you, I'm not interested in buying this anymore. So they paid way too much for it, and the development didn't take place for a long, long time. At the same time, they did build sports arenas, they built a museum, so they did make some improvements in the city, because those were done with the money that the land bank used to make before 2008. Uh, but then the city had to come under austerity measures and had to be bailed out by the national government. And now it's, I don't want to say it's a depressing place, at least not for that reason, it is a quite depressing place. Uh, but it's not depressing because of the austerity measures so much. It's still a relatively well of city, it's a very middle class city. Uh, but they, basically the city government itself can't make any decisions because they're under the supervision of the national government. So now I get to the conclusions, and I'm sure I have one minute left. Two, two even, that's even better. <laughs> Uh, so what we see in, in all of these cases, they are entirely different, you could say, but in all of them, public land is being used to ensure investors' profitability and market control. And at the same time, this is not just like, oh, we do everything for the market. At the same time, also, the cities themselves become quite entrepreneurial in doing this. And the better examples of this are the Brazilian cities and the Dutch cities. For the Italian example, this is less true, although for the city of Milan it is, but not the example I discussed in more detail. So, of course, there's differences here. And cities are no longer merely seen as a fix for accumulation elsewhere, but the urban land is mobilized to create leverage, as I already said, based on just the Italian case, and to seek profitable investment elsewhere. Land and real estate developments become key to municipal finance and development. It's no longer that it's just about the urban planning department who wants to do new projects. Actually, 
the real estate development, the land development in the city is being used to make money, which can then be used to pay other things that the municipality has to pay for. Especially in the context which is now so common in many countries where city governments have to do more, but don't get the tax authorities to actually bring in more money. So they have to do more with the same amount of money. So often these stories are told as being something like capture by finance, someone else loses, loses, used the term the long arm of finance going into the state and trying to exploit the state. This is happening to some extent, but this is not the entire story. This is also, at the municipal level, you see entrepreneurial strategies, calculative practices, financialized strategies, all taking place, all inter intertwined. Uh, and again, uh, the Brazilian example and the Dutch examples are, are clearer about the role of the municipality here than the Italian one. Um, and I think it would be hard to find more um, extreme cases than Brazil and the Netherlands in some way. So it's interesting that in some ways, uh, in general conclusions, they look quite similar. Last slide. Um, this means, if we uh, go a little bit to, our, to a more abstract level, that land and real estate are central to financialized capitalism. It's not just another asset to be financialized, it is the key asset to be financialized. And although the financialization of the city is geographically variegated, uh, there are many common trends and trajectories. And I could have shown a number of other cases, uh, either studies that I've been involved in or studies by other people who, who've worked on the same themes, and you would still see many uh, parallels between these cases. It doesn't mean they're all the same. It's, you can also tell a story where you say, Brazil is entirely different than what happens in the Netherlands. Um, and I think that story is less interesting because we expect Brazil to be entirely different from the Netherlands, right? I think it's much more interesting how, how similar in some ways the Brazilian planning authorities handle to the Dutch ones. With a completely different history, a completely different scale of the problems they tackle, a completely different scale of the cities, and still we see some of these parallels. And again, what is important here is all of these practices are enabled by state actors, either through regulation or through direct action. Um, but it often leads to excessive poorly managed real estates and therefore also financial risks. Uh, and this we see in many cases in, in Brazil, the projects, many of them are, are no longer going on. In Sao Paulo, some of them were quasi-finished before the crisis hit. Uh, but in Rio, there's basically a standstill. In the Netherlands, as we said, um, the crisis didn't hit that hard, but in the land development it did. We see also that the risks are now too big and these cities are under the control of the national government. And of course, the answer to many of us in the room would be quite obvious. We need something that we would call a definancialization of real estate and of the city. We need more welfare, we need more equity planning, we need more commoning. And this is exactly the moment that I should give the mic to Ivan, who has great ideas about how to do some of these things. So, uh, <clears throat> it is too late now to talk uh, about another concept, so I will try to show you many concrete examples. In a positive sense, what the local government, I am, in the focus of my presentation will be local governments, what they can do against uh, this kind of uh, one-sided developments uh, in the city. So, I will talk about uh, the problems, housing problems, urban problems, and they need integrated answers. I will talk a bit about the concept of integration. Then I will show some uh, examples for new housing areas and the regeneration of existing housing areas, what kind of problems these uh, uh, can, <coughs> can raise. Uh, the third part will be about inclusive and participative, participative development, so how to deal with the people. Probably there will be no time for the functional urban area topic, and then I will try to uh, draw some conclusions. What can be done for more balanced and inclusive uh, development? I go back to the great financial crisis. It was only 10 years ago, but we already forgot about uh, what kind of effects it caused in the world. The share of uh, deprived population increased, uh, uh, deprivation rates uh, increased, etc. Uh, in almost all cities, uh, uh, spatial segregation increased. Uh, interestingly enough, Amsterdam was the only exception. 
uh, and maybe Manuel could explain why, but in all other cities segregation increased. Uh, a enormous number of empty standing buildings in Europe and uh, this 11 million vacant buildings is roughly the same with the homeless population. But I do not show you the number of homeless people because this statistics is much less uh, reliable. So we know what is an empty standing flat, but we don't really know uh, uh, what kind of homeless uh, people exist. And then what is very important, regional and local budgets decreased a lot. So there is a new picture after 2010, problems are growing and local governments have less money, much, much less money because the bank sector have been saved and the money was taken away from the local governments. <clears throat> uh, there are newly emerging housing problems, and uh, uh, these housing problems would need interventions. Interventions to build new housing, affordable housing, and interventions to improve existing housing. And it is very clear that the market actors are needed. Without market interventions, it is impossible to do these things. But as Manuel has shown, the market actors have their own interests. So what the local, uh, local government has to do is uh, to create a balance between economic, environmental and social aspects while at the same time using the market actors. This is a very, very well known uh, uh, drawing about what integration means between environmental, social and economic uh, <coughs> aspects. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, integration also ha has got a new, uh, new uh, meaning. Uh, integration, if I just uh, illustrate it on the case of science parks, for example, science park was a concept very, very famous 10 years ago, and I think the uh, upper left science park is probably close to Lisbon, Oeiras or something, yeah, uh, and you can see separated from the city only for middle class employees, etc., etc., on the lower end, you have a science park in Helsinki, which is totally different within the city and also surrounded by, by housing, etc. So really totally different uh, uh, aspects what integration means. Of course, if we talk about integration, we have to talk about horizontal, vertical and territorial elements. The horizontal is probably the most important. We are sitting in a local government and uh, in these local governments, usually the head of the social department never talks to the uh, to the head of the financial department and so on. So uh, 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 the silos of policy making, this is something which is very important to, uh, 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 to fight. Uh, if I talk about good examples of policy integration, and now I am looking for, for, for uh, issues which local governments have to use if they want to fight one-sided policies, uh, then uh, I can talk, I can show an example of neighborhood regeneration or neighborhood management schemes. This is, for example, a picture about a German city uh, which really brought together, uh, brought together all the departments and these are becoming then part of a neighborhood forum which is discussing issues. Uh, this is in Duisburg. Uh, the vertical element of integration is equally important. We have to bring together the different levels of government, uh, multi-level government cooperation. Again, a German example, Soziale Stadt in Duisburg, where uh, the German state, North Rhine-Westphalia, uh, had a program for the most deprived areas and these areas were selected. And then there was a cooperation between the national level, the regional level and the local level to improve the, the most deprived areas. And they also, uh, put together ERDF and ESF money. But another very interesting example of this policy was uh, at, under Tony Blair, who is now almost completely forgotten, but when he, when he entered uh, uh, as UK Prime Minister, he launched the New Deal for Communities program, which was one of the biggest and uh, well, most uh, uh, well-established program for deprived areas. Uh, so. I suggest you to go back to the history of this program. Over 10 years, 39 deprived areas have got 50 million British pounds each, and there was a compulsory criteria of local selection, which actions have to be uh, carried out uh, in the area, and this was the best, per, best monitored program ever, because it has a lot of money of monitoring and also questionnaires 
to people, etc. So it was really a very interesting program for multi-level governance. <clears throat> Uh, then, of course, the territorial cooperation is very important. This is the, this is the case of Lille, which is a city of 200,000 people. But Lille Metropole decides together about the basic issues like uh, strategic planning, like housing, urban transport. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> if, you asked, uh, if you would ask a mayor of a small settlement uh, here, why is he participating in the, he or she participating in the, Lille Metropole board, then the mayor would say that I have lost the power to decide about public transport, but I can influence public transport because my vote is one of the 85 votes in the, in the board. So uh, this metropolitan cooperation is really very important. <clears throat> uh, if we talk about integration, then we, can, uh, then we can analyze projects concretely to what extent they are integrated. And we did a did a study together with uh, ECORIS and London School of Economics about housing projects which were financed for Europe, from European money. For example, Latvian project uh, to isolate from outside uh, large housing estate buildings, which was, the money was spread out to each large housing estate building, regardless on the social composition, etc., of the people. Or a integrated approach in Hungary where where European money was used uh, to improve some uh, also energy efficiency, but also the public space, also the shops, and also some training interventions, or a case in, uh, in Czech Republic where, where the money was used to improve buildings in the poorest part of the, of the city full with Roma uh, people. So if you analyze these uh, projects, then we can find out which one are closer to be integrated. The Latvian one obviously was not integrated, but the uh, Czech Republic, Hungary, and obviously the German projects were more integrated. So you can, you can have a look about the interventions and to what extent they are integrated. And obviously, if you want to achieve something integrated, and again, I am thinking in positive terms about local governments. So my local governments differ a bit from those uh, Manuel is looking for, because Manuel's local governments are participating in land, uh, land uh, uh, projects, etc. I am looking for those local governments who really want to work for the, for the benefit of the people. So uh, they are working about uh, include uh, the, the residents, uh, pu public participation, the involvement of experts, the knowledge, uh, and this goes back to the expert project that you, finish, you are finishing now, how the experts are evaluating things, and obviously the deliberative approach of politicians. <coughs> uh, there are some aspects which are pushing local governments for integrated thinking. If you don't have money, then you have to start to think in different ways. So probably very interesting integrated projects are going on in Greece. I think Greece is now one of the most interesting places to look for such projects because they are really in a very, very bad situation. Sometimes natural disasters are helping integration. This was the case in Prague. In Prague, the city never talked to the surrounding settlements and vice versa. And then it came the big flood and they understood that the water doesn't know where is the administrative border of Prague, so they have to cooperate. And when they start to cooperate in water uh, protection, then they, they will also start uh, to work in other issues. Uh, but there are very big difficulties to achieve integrated development. Uh, the neoliberal economies uh, are strong and getting strong again. This is just a picture about, about Dublin, which was these areas were prepared for, for residential development and they are now staying empty for more than 10 years, but I'm sure the capital will come back here. This is interestingly a uh, Dutch example, which can be called revanchist regeneration. This is an area, a social housing area in one of the Dutch cities, which the local government wanted to demolish because they say it is, it is a bit outdated and not so nice, etc. But in fact, they want to bring back the middle class taxpayers into the city. Uh, I hope that the local people could defend this area. And this is finally a picture which I like very much. This is in Belgrade, and Belgrade is a city where you can probably find the most funny uh, drawings on the walls. And this is obviously a developer who is eating because he has a tie, yeah? 
and he is, he is eating the last, uh, the last uh, three of the, of the city. So uh, opportunity planning means that the, the local leaders are really giving everything to the developers, and this is an example which is close to Manuel's example. Now, <coughs> I try to show you a good and probably a not so good example of integrated development in practice. Uh, how can you uh, achieve a balance between the different aspects of integrated development and how can you keep it? Let's go to Vienna. Vienna, and I am talking now about new development, about areas which are really uh, developed uh, brand new. This is Aspen Seestadt, probably some of you know Vienna. This is uh, uh, within the city borders, but some 15 kilometers away from the city center. It was a, it was a airport and this airport has closed down, and now Vienna is, uh, is uh, quickly growing, so they need new housing, so they decided to have a housing area here. Uh, they established an artificial lake, and now the housing is, is being built. The interesting, there are many interesting aspects which I found when I visited this place, which are completely different from what uh, uh, would happen in similar cases in other countries. Metro line, arrived to this place before the first resident was moving into the place. The uh, neighborhood management office was opened before the first resident came to the, to the place. So these are two issues which I cannot imagine, for example, in Hungary to happen, that public transport is there and also the social workers and, uh, and uh, a capacity to deal with the people is there. All types of subsidized housing forms are assured here. Developers are selected and the developers have to build social housing and also affordable housing in return of a uh, quantity of free finance housing what they can, uh, they can uh, do. The whole, whole area is connected to the district heating grid and also a special development agency has been formed. So everything was based on land ownership of the city of Vienna, dealing with non-profit developers and assuring from the first moment that this public uh, transport-based development will become really mixed because all types of housing forms will be there. There are just a few pictures about, uh, about this uh, housing development. Uh, and then a lot of other issues which are details now that uh, they, don't, they did not allow a shopping center to be built but they created a shopping street. Uh, uh, they, they limited uh, 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 parking and developers had to pay contribution to uh, joint mobility solutions uh, like e-bikes, rental bike system. So all types of innovative uh, issues were tried out in, in this area of Vienna. Now let's have another example from a similarly developed uh, country, uh, Stockholm. <coughs> this uh, this uh, happened a few years earlier than the Aspen Zestad project, which is still under construction. A similarly large development project for 25,000 residents. Uh, uh, again, the idea was to have a completely integrated project with social aims, with social, average social composition than uh, the city of Stockholm, and all innovative solutions uh, for water, energy, and waste. And this is a... Uh, area which was a uh, harbor area, and this, this harbor area has been redeveloped uh, into a quite nicely looking uh, urban place. Now, from outside you cannot see the difference, but what happened in Stockholm was that the original aim to have a balance between environmental, economic and social aspects uh, uh, faced the, the challenge from uh, financial crisis. The prices went up. And the city was insisting till the last moment to have the environmental standards, which means that housing became much more expensive than originally planned and the social aspect is gone. Uh, uh, maybe it is a too easy evaluation, but uh, here you can see this is a bourgeois environmentalism, uh, a place which was meant to be an average place uh, for Stockholm population became a place for middle class uh, people. So, uh, uh, what is the message from these two uh, examples is that it is difficult to create a balance between 
uh, economic, environmental, and social aspects. And you, you have to have your eyes always through the whole process on the balance between these aspects. And maybe if, if prices are changing or something is changing, you have to revisit your original uh, ideas, uh, mostly regarding the social aspects, in, in order to be able to, uh, to, to, to keep the balance. Of course, there are uh, uh, innovative tools to support the social uh, aims, inclusionary zoning, uh, force the developers to produce affordable housing. There is a, a, a also a protective zoning law of Vienna, which I cannot go into the details, but Vienna immediately reacted on the financialization of housing, and when they discovered that after Berlin, the financial capital investments would like to come to Vienna, they immediately established the regulation which excludes the financial investors. So there is no point now for an investor to go and buy up land in Vienna because uh, there is no profit which the investor could, uh, could do. And then there is very interesting uh, development going on in Berlin. In Berlin, the red, red, green coalition tries to do something against uh, financialization and they even want to fight big investors to split up uh, their housing stock. Uh, these are pictures about uh, a French city where uh, inclusionary zoning shows uh, buildings close to each other. One of them is public rent, public uh, housing, the other one is social housing, the third is, is, pri is private, free finance, and you don't see any difference between these buildings. Uh, I will not go into the details of these social uh, mixed policies. Uh, uh, by the way, it is an interesting topic. How can you, how can you influence uh, uh, existing neighborhoods? How can you intervene uh, into, in, into neighborhoods to create more social mix? I go now to, a, to, a, to another aspect. So uh, until now, I was, I was discussing new housing. What can you do with new housing to keep the integration, the balance between three aspects? What can you do with existing housing, with regeneration? And uh, here, uh, uh, I will talk about public, publicly uh, oriented, public led uh, urban redevelopment. Because if you don't have the public sector intervening, then it happens uh, what I saw in London. I am walking in London uh, uh, towards the city center, and in a quite normal neighborhood, you can discover the changes. And then finally, the changes totally take over uh, the area. So the the international financial investors, and maybe London is one of the best examples of financialization. Some of these buildings might be empty even now, and uh, this is the final, uh, uh, final outcome. All apartments now sold to totally different people than uh, who, was, who was living there earlier. <clears throat> so how can you influence regeneration? How can you keep the balance between the three aspects if you regenerate uh, a project. I think this is the basic, uh, basic drawing which, uh, which maybe you can memorize. This has been developed by Claude Jacquier, a French sociologist. This is the time axis and this is the value. Now you have a building which has in a given time a given value and with time the value of the building because it is uh, getting a bit outdated, it is, uh, it is uh, uh, older now, is losing in value. And in that moment of time, you are thinking about regeneration. But if you make a regeneration, you always have choices. To what level you will regenerate the building? You can regenerate it as it was earlier. You can even make it nicer than it was earlier. Or you can make some investments which keep the building and does not allow it to further regenerate. And the important thing is that these decisions are connected to social consequences. Obviously, this is the gentrification, uh, gentrification uh, choice, that you make the building even nicer, and obviously the people cannot pay for it, so there will be a total change of population. This can be partly gentrification, and this is probably the most difficult choice. Then you, you do it for the residents themselves, who are not able to pay much, so you cannot invest really a lot into this, uh, into this building. So I will... I will just show you one, some examples of, of urban renewal. Uh, I like urban renewal because this is one of the most difficult uh, public uh, investments and most complex 
issues where you really have to think about physical and social and obviously environmental aspects. Uh, one of the projects uh, I show you or one of the approaches is again Vienna. Uh, in Vienna there have, they have a very uh, complex system of urban renewal. This is an area outside the Gürtel. The Gürtel is the limit between the uh, between the better parts and the worst parts of Vienna, and usually tourists who come to Vienna, they never go outside the Gürtel. So next time you go to Vienna, please walk a bit outside the Gürtel. These are areas where you have this kind of housing, uh, and the areas where many of the migrants who came to Vienna are living. And for these areas, Vienna has a very systematic urban renewal aspect where the city is, to, is establishing urban renewal bureaus in selected areas, and these people talk with the landowners. One third of the housing is, is a municipality owned, another one third is usually private landlords, and the third one can be uh, privately owned. And they talk with the, with the uh, landlords, and finally they achieve regeneration. And there are very many important aspects behind. Uh, uh, in, this, in, in, in this case, in, uh, in, uh, in Vienna, there is a rent tribu uh, tribunal which is deciding about the rent level. The uh, private landlords, they can get subsidies if they don't increase the rents. There are agreements about demolishing uh, some of the courtyard areas of the building. Uh, if, uh, and again, the private landlords get subsidy for that if they don't decrease the rent. So it's a very, very difficult and complex system, but the outcome is that the physical structure is improving and most of the local population can, can stay there. Now, another example is uh, in uh, Budapest. Uh, it was done in the 1990s, a much poorer city than Vienna, and uh, a poor area of Budapest where uh, an urban regeneration project was going on, and this was the original layout of the, of the block. And then you can see some new housing, and many of, the, many of the side parts of the buildings have been demolished. So it became a much nicer area than it was earlier. This is how it looked like earlier, and after investments, uh, this, this became the outcome of this uh, of this area, so a kind of quite quite nice uh, area to live in. This is not there. This is uh, roughly 500 meters or one kilometer away to where the poor people of the previous areas have been moved. You know, if you don't have money like at the city, Budapest has much, much less money than Vienna, you cannot compensate the poor people to be able to pay the higher rents. You have to move them out, and then the capital is willing to build new housing for the middle class people. So this was the price to pay in the case of Budapest. To renovate the area, it was the local government managed the gentrification, but people have got replacement flats, and they were given a somewhat a bit better flat than, than, than they had earlier. Another example in Budapest, uh, which was in 2005, how much time I have? Yeah. Ten, minutes. Ten minutes, very good. Uh, a pilot area where a socially sensitive urban renewal um, has, has been uh, carried out. This is really one of the poorest areas of, uh, of, of, of Budapest. Uh, you can see the, the circumstances of this area. And uh, this is called Magdolna area. And in this area, an urban renewal project started. The city did not have money, uh, the population was poor, but they don't want it to get rid of the original population. So what you can do in such a case is not to renovate the buildings themselves. The most, uh, most uh, programs uh, in, this, uh, in this case were uh, creating communities, uh, uh, making the public space nicer, having an educational program, safety program, and only making some intervention in the housing stock when some European money arrived. This was a clear example where the city acknowledged that if we make a complete urban renewal, then the original population has to go, like in the case of Ferenc Varos. So if we want to do something for the original population, then we have to make a lower level of, uh, of intervention. And this is the outcome 
This is the central square of the area, which has been renovated. Here is a, here is a, a, a community house. This school has been improved. But the buildings around, they are not much nicer than they were earlier. This is what you can do if you don't have too much uh, public money. Uh, so uh, if we try to classify these cases, uh, what does it mean uh, uh, integrated renewal? Then we can see that if you, if you have a weak public control and not too much public money, then you will do the Ferenc Varos market-oriented renewal with gentrification outcomes. If you have a bit stronger public control, you make a socially sensitive renewal, you don't have too much money. But then here you have the other examples when you have stronger public uh, control and also substantial public money. So you can make an optimal intervention in urban renewal if, if the society is rich. And you can make some kind of acceptable version even if you don't have too much money. <clears throat> so uh, uh, if I go one step further and I say that in, for these integrated projects, for being able to resist the, the, the push from the side of, of, of the capital, we need really participatory models. But what does it mean, participation? Uh, you, probably you all know this uh, Einstein ladder for citizens' participation. This is a textbook example, criticized a lot. Uh, she did it in 1969. But I think it's a very good introductory step to understand that some people understand manipulation under participation just to manipulate people to tell them that you are involved, but they are not. On the other end, you have a, really a citizen control like the, like the CLLD where a local group decides about the money. And in between, you have a lot of, a lot of steps what you can do. Now, how can you really increase public, uh, public participation? What are the tools for a local government uh, to, uh, to involve people, to, uh, to give them a bit more power. Uh, I will show you a few examples uh, which, are, uh, which, came, uh, which mushroomed during the financial crisis. The financial crisis was an interesting period because problems emerged, public money was less, disappearing, and cities had to think about what to do. So let's see uh, an uh, example in Bremen, uh, relatively rich German city, an inner city shopping center. They wanted to demolish it, but instead of demolishing it, they, uh, because it was empty, they rented it out to a social cafe, to a sharing space, workspace, second-hand uh, shop, etc. Amsterdam North, uh, uh, the Coeville, probably uh, you know it very well, uh, a place uh, which was staying empty, extremely polluted, and no one knew what to do with that. And then some young people came and, and they said, if we bring used houseboats, then on these houseboats you can, we can introduce uh, offices. Because it was so polluted that you couldn't build anything on that. But if you have a houseboat and on the houseboat, uh, you can do something. So an idea which the city accepted and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and something happened. And you did not have to pay for the decontamination. Uh, urban gardening, which is a, a, a really very well known by now uh, procedure, you can also uh, link it to social inclusion examples. And then you can make a citywide program of urban gardening. In Rotterdam, this urban garden is at the top of the, of the building, connected to other parts of the, of the, of the, of, of the city. Crowd building, which is again a fantastic idea. Uh, Netherlands is uh, really uh, very good in this day. They were thinking about how can we create new housing. Housing is so expensive. But in the meantime, millions of square meters of office buildings are staying empty. So they created a, a young architect bureau, created the idea of crowd building to offer a empty standing office building on internet for, for people. And after people, enough number of people came together that they can imagine a living in this office building. After that, uh, the, the, the architectural bureau made a plans for the, re, for the conversion. The people created the housing association. The housing association went to the bank. They got the loan. They paid the owner of the original office building. And then they refurbished the office building into housing. So it's a fantastic idea. 
and the architect who was organizing it has got money only in the last step. So this is a different type of job. You are not sitting in your, in your chair and you are waiting for the next contract, but you have to think about how can you create something which is, you, which is useful. And now I can call the attention of a, an Urbex uh, website, which is remaking the city.urbex, which is full with this kind of city examples. And one of them is these are uh, a type. Uh, these are the types of, of urban uh, challenges: uh, underused buildings, underused areas, rundown, segregated areas, etc. And these are these are the steps of a action planning procedure. And obviously, if we talk about active, uh, of uh, citizen participation, the mapping, activating, and visioning, experimenting are the most important uh, parts. And I will just click on this uh, area, and, uh, and uh, here you can find the description of a project in Casoria, which is a city close to Naples, a very problematic city, uh, uh, densely built up and quite poor. And how Casoria is thinking about now, step by step, to activate the population to make them interested how the city uh, will develop in the future. Uh, and then uh, some uh, projects which are really going on with citizen, act, uh, citizen uh, participation. This is Berlin, which has a very, very good neighborhood management system, which I cannot uh, dis describe now into the details. And I will not talk to you about the BIPZIP program because probably you know, you know it better than, than, than I, I know it. Uh, but then I met uh, Atelier Mob uh, here in Lisbon, and this was for me an interesting example when a, a architectural bureau starts to work with the poor people, with the poor area, uh, starts to legalize the area, uh, to, to, uh, to really to, uh, to work with the people together, and finally they manage to, be, uh, to become part of the BIBSI program, and finally they manage to get their money uh, back what they invested at the beginning. <clears throat> and then uh, what is very important, and this is the last uh, last uh, uh, chapter of participation is how can you really get in connection with the people? How can you really make them interested to raise ideas? And for this, I think Desi de Madrid is one of the best examples. It's an online platform to which 400,000 people are registered. This is really a well-developed method for, for getting uh, the ideas of people uh, together. Uh, a well-known hacker is the, is the leader of communication in Madrid, and he developed this system. And all ideas which uh, get more than 20,000 uh, uh, 20, votes are considered by the city and made calculations how much does it cost. And then the 100 million euro participatory budgeting, 100 million euro, can you imagine? This is based on the, on the ideas which, uh, which this... Uh, this uh, uh, system develops. I don't know whether this system exists still because unfortunately, as you know, the mayor of Madrid has changed and this uh, can really create problems in this kind of systems. Anyway, uh, I will not talk about the Metropolitan Challenge, I just go to the conclusions. <coughs> uh, so what should be done for more balanced and inclusive urban development? Uh, I think uh, it, is, it, is, it, it, is, it would be very important to have more EU involvement. We, uh, I am a bit positive about the EU. Many here probably are not so much, but I am an optimist in, optimistic person in itself, and I am also optimistic about the EU. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, EU could do more, obviously, for uh, active uh, involvement. Uh, uh, but what, what are the possibilities if there are not so many... Uh, ideas on the EU level. Uh, there, is, there is one, uh, one slide about uh, housing financialization. There are many ideas now housing, how housing financialization can, could be stopped or at least made easier uh, and what, what, what kind of role the EU could, could do in this regard. I have, I have no time to go into the details of this, but probably the EU is quite reluctant at the moment to do that. Uh, there are also ideas developed by Urbex, what could be done with deprived neighborhoods. Uh, and uh, and uh, we just uh, uh, prepared a paper for the EU about a local pact idea that you can, you can, 
improve deprived neighborhoods based on the urban community initiative idea to give money to a neighborhood uh, and then uh, a kind of multi-level government agreement for the poor areas and connect it together with, uh, uh, with the CLLD elements. So innovative organizational elements in this model would be a multi-level governance board having a national, regional and local representative having a coordination between different budget resources, EU budget resources, and having a community of local stakeholders, of the local people and NGOs who decide what can be done in this uh, area. And finally, there could be a CLLD element, which, I mean, Lisbon is probably the only one or, uh, of two uh, positive urban CLLD uh, uh, examples in Europe, where no one has a majority in the local local association or the local group which decides about the money. Uh, so a combination of top-down and bottom-up elements uh, would, would be very important. However, these are not the times that such ideas can, can really be established. Uh, this is the political reality, more or less. Pure, uh, poor Europe is threatened by terrorism, Brexit, debt, refugees, etc. So what, what, can the Europe, what can Europe do? And for the moment, there are not too many steps forward. So there is a slight uh, an idea to increase the money to the cities for five, from five to six uh, percentage, but there is no, no chance for radical changes in, uh, in, in, in EU financing, and there is not even clear how much the EU budget will be. So in fact, I think that, and this is the last, the last part of my presentation, my only hopes is in cities. Uh, 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 the potential role of cities has to be really strengthened. And uh, I mean, I am quoting here Enzo Mingione, who has a very pessimistic view about, he's a famous Italian sociologist, a very pessimistic uh, uh, view about uh, capitalism and, uh, and how, how capitalism uh, uh, could be changed. Uh, and we can all, all think, and we can also find um, other cartoons which are describing, uh, you see that this is uh, uh, the top one percentage controls 46, top one percentage of people control 46 percentage of wealth in the world, and they still think that it is not enough. So anyway, we can, we can, have, we can have this kind of, uh, of negative views, but I think the cities in the last 10 years, they really introduced a lot of interesting innovations, and uh, these are just a few examples, flexible governments, urban commerce, uh, basic income, affordable housing. Uh, I tried to show you some examples, some, uh, uh, some cases about that. So in fact, cities could become game, changer, game changers. Not so much than the uh, social movements. You know, social movements was once our hope that, that people occupy really the main square of uh, Madrid and uh, Barcelona and etc. But social movements are coming and going. But if a city is changing, the city can develop the people into, uh, into citizens, into people who will not accept anymore uh, what is going on on the, on the, on the national level. So the European cities are bastions of resistance against the extreme right and against nationalistic policies. And there are a growing number of cities in Europe where the city itself is so-called progressive and have a nationalist government, etc. So Poland, Hungary, uh, but many, many other countries now. And here are, here are the mayors. Unfortunately, some of them have changed. So, uh, she is not anymore the mayor of Madrid. She became a bit weaker in Barcelona. I don't know whether he continues in Valencia or not. But Anne Hidalgo is still there in Paris. And to my greatest uh, satisfaction, Budapest has a new mayor. And this mayor is really a person who, who shares all the, all the views what, what we think uh, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, progressive uh, in urban development. And then the Fearless Cities Conference, where where Ada Colau brought together 180 cities, uh, uh, 60 countries, five, uh, 600 people, uh, creating the municipalist network uh, and, and really making statements that cities can change uh, the realities, I think, are very, very, very promising. So uh, uh, there are some people who say that, uh, that cities can change the, the world. Uh, 
uh, radically green progress is possible with the support of people. And obviously, if cities are strong, then extremist uh, forces have no chance. But other people say that neither the state policies nor the basic rules of capitalism can be changed from below. So there are some people who say that, that yeah, we can, we can be happy about the new mayor. We can be happy, but, but uh, these, these mayors cannot not, uh, not bring back uh, large changes. And by today, the crisis is over and capital-led global macrostructures are... Uh, are uh, dominating again. So one city is not enough. So why not a networks of cities? And we have a lot of good examples. We have the European Metropolitan Authority Forum. We have Eurocities. We have the uh, Municipalist Network. Uh, and one example of, of fighting is uh, the case of Airbnb, which is part of Manuel's topic. Airbnb, the way how the, f uh, the, the capital is really... Uh, uh, taking over the potential affordable housing stock of a city which disappears from the social uh, sector. And Airbnb was going to, uh, going to Brussels and they lobbied the commission that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, Airbnb is uh, exclusively a digital service provider. And they achieved a statement by the Advocate General of the European Court of Justice that Airbnb cannot be attacked on because they are, uh, they are bad for the hotel industry or for or, or affordable housing. So there's a danger now that those cities which are fighting against Airbnb, like Lisbon, uh, Barcelona, Paris, etc., they will be uh, punished by the European Commission because of uh, uh, un uneven competition or whatever. But then 10 mayors go together and join, uh, they create a joint declaration and they visit Brussels against Airbnb, and they go to the same people. So if 10 mayors go to Brussels, this is something. Then they can meet the commissioner, they can meet uh, uh, leading, leading uh, uh, officers of the European Commission. So I think this is the way how you should, find, how you should fight the big, uh, uh, big uh, uh, interests. Uh, this is the last slide before you kill me, uh, Simone. Uh, I think that the EU could do a lot for the cities. Uh, there are some ideas about help them directly, give them, give them money for inclusive and uh, participatory uh, development of poor areas, give them money to create uh, metropolitan areas, which I could not talk about, and also strengthen local democracy in the cities. And I think uh, the progressive development ideas can only break through if the European level works together with the cities, and the cities work together among themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have some time. Project holding the mic around questions. So, well, uh, uh, if I have to say something from uh, the Portuguese perspective, it would be that we would like to go a bit more towards Vienna, but it seems like we're going more towards Rio de Janeiro. And uh, in terms of what you know, we are doing at the, at, the, at the local, at the national level. But then there is another thing which puts together the, the two presentations quite nicely. Because I think, uh, yes, of course, Ivan has showed, shown that it is very complex creating integrated program and making regeneration well. But Manuel also shows that it's very complex to create a space for financialization. So there's definitely some space of action, be it at the local, at the national, or the European level, and that's, I think, a major issue where it should actually change be pushed, because I, I, I think there's someone on here on the audience who should argue for the need for social movements more than for cities or states, etc. I'm personally one of those who is very pessimistic about the EU, but is much more pessimistic about national states. So I think either we change the EU or that it's expecting the states to do something is really, it's truly naive. So yeah. It, changing the EU is almost impossible, but it's probably the only chance. But it's just my personal opinion, and I would like to hear from the audience. Joanna's got the mics. 
Come on. First question is always the hardest. So we go to the second question. <laughs> yeah, we got the second question, see? <laughs> Please present yourself. Um, yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Jessica. I'm working at ICS here. Um, I was just uh, at the end of Ivan's presentation and now also with what Simone is saying, thinking that isn't it a little bit maybe unfair to put our attention on cities considering that actually, I mean, the countryside is having a lot of issues too. It's not just, I mean, there's more people living in cities, but that doesn't mean that um, the countryside in Europe is doing very well. And maybe focusing our attention um, on cities as kind of the game changers, wouldn't that maybe lead to even more um, spatial inequalities? That's a tough one. So maybe, I mean, since there's, even do you want to react on this? You are right. Uh, the countryside is equally important uh, to the cities. But uh, my experience is that uh, uh, smaller settlements are much more efficiently manipulated by national policies. I may, maybe I'm too pessimistic. I'm coming from Hungary, you know. And I know that, that the, the recent changes, when more than half of the Hungarian population is really fed up with the existing system, resulted in political changes only on the level of the largest cities. And the whole countryside voted continu continuously for the present leadership. And the same resulted uh, to the uh, election of Mr. Trump. The big cities were against him, but those flyover area, when you fly from the eastern to the western coast of the states and you don't even look down where a substantial part of the population is living, they are a flyover area, they all voted for Trump. So I don't have really an answer about how to, how to continue the changes. But I say that the easiest is to start to the changes with the cities, where the population is more informed and, and uh, has better knowledge about the political constellation, and it can easily ha easier happen that the political leader is changing. And then how, how to and then these changes can lead to a free press, to free media, and then the changes can hap can happen in in uh, those parts of the country where 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 uh, less less knowledge and less attention is paid to societal issues. Manuel, do you want to react on this? No. <laughs> More. Yeah, please. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your, both the presentation. Um, my name is Barbara Pizzo, I, I live and work in Rome. And um, uh, my, my, my point is that uh, I'm really interested in, uh, uh, I, I, take the, 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 I took the idea from, from even uh, one of the last sentences in which he, he wrote, there is a, there is a uh, this kind of sentence, cities as game changer at the end, the end of your presentation. And also at the end of uh, Manuel's presentation, there was uh, something related to uh, the definancialization of real estate and, and cities and uh, um, welfare equity planning and, and commoning and so on. And I wanted to, to try to, to, to put to, to make a kind of bridge between these two sentences, final sentences, because uh, according to me, it's, it could be really interesting to have cities as, as, as uh, game changers, but how? The point is, uh, is how it should be possible to have something like that. In the sense that first, I think that we all know that cities are not individual actors. And uh, second, uh, much less they are independent actors. And so there are all the, the issues about uh, transnational and global phenomena that, that cities, uh, how can they face this kind of phenomena? And so the point should be something like, like 
at what scale they can really act and how. Um, is if I uh, if I um, if I can just uh, mention uh, the case of Vienna, which I know pretty well. Um, I have been visiting professor there uh, two years ago, and I had the chance to study very in, in depth the the, 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 the the system, the, the the Austrian system, but in particular the Vienna system, which is not exactly the Austrian system. One of the main differences and one of the main tools that they have in order to be uh, to become um, game changers is exactly the fact that the the the, the land, the urban land, is owned by the, the the city of Vienna. So there is a, a main issue about land ownership, which is public owned uh, in most of the case. So probably this is one of the one of the. What do you think about this is, uh, as a, one of the tools in which uh, the cities can be really react toward the un un unwanted uh, result of, for example, urban renewal and so on? Uh, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to respond to you as well as to some of the implicit debates between your comments and Yvonne's presentation. So I think, first of all, financialization and integrative development are not necessarily opposites. I think financialization, although I've given some examples where um, it goes out of hand, I think some of the things you can do with it can actually be uh, positive. Uh, you can say, um, if in Brazil the same model with the financial instruments that are being sold in financial markets is still used to redistribute money to other neighborhoods, it could actually be a great tool of, of social redistribution uh, to poorer parts of the city, as, as it used to do before it was actually a financial product, but when it was just done through planning regulation. Um, I think also even now in the Brazilian case, there's still uh, public transport is being developed, so there's still good things happening. Uh, I mean, in the, in the Dutch case also we saw um, museums being built uh, and things like that. So a lot of things are actually done through financialization with the public benefits, but the risks are often uh, undervalued. So I think that there's one thing there where I don't think there's a complete opposite. I think I share some of Simona's pessimism about the role of the state, whether at the local level or at the European level or anywhere else. Um, at the same time, um, although I'm not as, as hopeful as Ivan, I, I, I think uh, we have no other way than to than to rely at least partly on the state. I think the idea that it can all be commoning and all can be bottom up, I think is naive because the state is there. So I think, um, although it's very difficult to, to change what the state does at whatever level, uh, we have to try it. Um, and you asked at what scale can we act? Uh, I think at all skills we can act, and I think we have to act at all skills at the same time. I think it's it's impossible only to do something at the neighborhood level, and I think it's also o impossible to do also only something at the European level. In fact, the European Union has housing policies, but they're called financial policies. Um, the capital market union uh, is being rolled out throughout Europe as a policy that's supposed to be a policy that helps entrepreneurs find money. In fact, it's a policy that rolls out uh, market securitization to Eastern Europe, where many Eastern European countries don't have it yet. Uh, and it's being rolled out further to Southern European countries where some have a little bit of it and some have a lot of it, like Spain. Um, so in effect, there are already a lot of these policies. So I'm also skeptical that the European Union is the best institution to do a lot of these things because whenever they, they do something, they tend to be uh, more heavily lobbied by financial institutions and by other powerful actors than they are by people. But again, if the European Union wouldn't do anything, I think it would be worse. I mean, the, the worst thing about the European Union would not being in it, as we see with the Brexit now. In the Netherlands and France, there was a majority of people who wanted to be leaving the EU as well. Thanks to the Brexit, I think this is, this is going the other direction. <laughs> So I think the solution also here would not be not to have the EU, but we still need to hope to try to change the EU. Uh, but it's not so easy. Uh, the problem with the EU, which is often being said in the media, is that there's too much bureaucracy. The problem is probably that there's too little bureaucracy in the European Union. The European Union has fewer bureaucrats working uh, in the offices of the European Union than the city of Leeds. 
Um, so probably we actually need more European Union, but we need also a different European Union to do this. At the city level, I think it's difficult, but I think Ivan showed that there's many examples and even some in places where there's not a lot of money. And I think one thing that's often not being used a lot is the planning power, which doesn't necessarily need to cost money. Uh, I mean, yes, Dutch cities often have some money, but the fact that they demand 30% so social housing doesn't cost them anything. It just means that the developers can make less uh, money on the development, which means they're willing to pay less money for the land. But as long as they can still sell 70% market rate housing, uh, they're more than happy to do the 30% as well. Um, so I think some of the planning doesn't necessarily need to cost money. I think the Brazilian example also is a case where you could actually do some of these things without the city investing as well. In the Brazilian case, they still decide to put additional tax money into a lot of these developments. But some of the, the land value capture mechanisms that are operating there, um, if you would use them in a better way, you could actually have some of the benefits without spending a lot. So they, I think there's a lot of reasons, a lot of, not not reasons, there's a lot of things that could be done in a positive manner. It's just not the fact that by having a progressive government that it will happen. I mean, Ivan mentioned a lot of examples of progressive governments that do good things. I think there's, there's unfortunately, a lot of other governments that on paper are progressive, have a left-wing majority, and are not doing great things. Uh, yeah. Um, so um, there are many ways, many instruments that could be used, but they're not being used enough. I've spoken for too long. Yeah. Can I? Uh, yes. Can I just uh, thank you for the question that cities are not independent actors, and uh, I know the cities are part of a state system, and uh, the, the, the state national level can do a lot against cities which are not behaving well. On the other hand, we have the sanctuary cities in the U.S., cities which just say that we will not perform what Mr. Trump wants, and they give papers to migrants against the will of the national government. We have the Covenant of Mayors in Europe, which are signatory, the, the signatures, uh, signatories of the Covenant of Mayors. They take on much bigger steps against CO2 emission than the national level is doing. So you are able to do something which is progressive, and if many, many uh, sub-national entities are doing that, this can have an effect on the national level. I agree that the, that the Vienna example, which I love very much, is completely unique because it is really based on the ownership uh, of, uh, of, uh, of land and the hundred years of tradition of non-profit housing associations. These are missing in most of the European countries. But if you look at Berlin, Berlin tries to go into this direction to take back uh, property from the developers, to t take back some of the, to increase the, 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 the public uh, uh, the public uh, uh, ownership. Uh, probably uh, uh, an even more, so property is important, but an even more aspect, what, what Manuel said at the end, is the planning power. So in Hungary, the state level, Mr. Orban, is as strong as he was earlier. He, he is a kind of uh, very, very strong. He is the only leader in Europe which has a super majority in the parliament, two-thirds of the seats. But the mayor of Budapest can stop some of the national projects in Budapest, not giving planning permission. So there is a first time in uh, Orban's uh, last 10 years when he really has an opponent, and we will see what will happen. Uh, who will? So they are planning. This this planning power is really, uh, really, really uh, uh, very important. So uh, uh, I think that that. The start for the changes, in my opinion, can be from the local level. I still think so. <laughs> we take one more, yes, Juliet. One um, thing that I was thinking, for we need to think also like developers and what the developers think about planning system and housing systems. And one of the words that I didn't hear mentioned was the significance of risk in development decisions. Land value increases in, va in value, but the developer's taking a gamble on the planning being changed. There's so strong negotiation going on in London at the moment between developers and London government to try to address the question of risk 
in development appraisals in, so that the planning department and the developers are using the same assumptions. And I think we need new instruments like that actually acknowledging that developers build most things um, and that they have particular needs if they're going to be able to um, capture and return any kind of community value. Um, if they have very high risk, they won't. If they have less risk or if they're trading off risk against um, capturing community value and returning it, then they may well think differently. We haven't really explored that problem because it's a new problem on the agenda. I, I think that's a question, but I don't know how to phrase it as a question. Yeah, I think this is more the topic of Manuel, but uh, uh, I would say that uh, uh, I have a little knowledge about financialization of housing, for example. But if, uh, if there would be a like, regulation which says that uh, real estate units, they cannot be kept empty, and real estate units cannot be rented out to people who are not from the local housing market. This would immediately change the behavior of developers vis-a-vis uh, -vis financial investments into the housing sector. And in principle, it is possible because ownership in Europe does not only mean that you have uh, rights. It, in some countries, in Germany, it is nicely said in the constitution that if you are owner of a flat, then you have to use it as a flat. But obviously it is not really used this sentence to fight empty flats. And in Hungary, if someone would ask a person who has three flats, what are you doing with the other two if they are kept empty, then this person would, would shoot, shoot you because you say that you, this is my, my, my job. This is my, uh, I, I am an owner. I can do whatever I want. So I think the regulation of ownership would be very important to fight uh, this kind of uh, tendencies. And then developer would change their opinion. Well, let's say a developer uh, buys a plot of land and they think they can develop something. Then, if the government regulation changed, they may have paid too much for the land and they may not be interested. And they say they've taken a too big gamble, we can make a profit. On the other hand, if the regulation is already in place, they know exactly what's expected of them. And what will happen if they say, like, we can make less profit there, they're willing to pay less for the land which means actually the land values don't go up as much. So the planning power is the power to decide what will be the, the, the price developers or other investors want to pay for the land. If you say we need 30% social housing here, uh, developers will say in the lobby, then we can't make profit anymore. That's nonsense. They will just be able, to, they will be willing to pay less money for the land, which is a good development. Uh, they will just lower whatever they will pay for the land to an amount where they can still make enough profit. So I don't think there is, a, there is necessarily a problem there. There's a problem if you change the regulation uh, halfway. This is always the case with all kinds of institutions. If you change the rules of the game uh, during the process, this is problematic. If the rules of the games are clearly laid out. In the Netherlands, if you have a new urbanization project, doesn't matter where it is, you need to do 30% social housing. Developers, of course, don't want to do that, but they still do it because they can still make enough money and they will just pay less for the land because they know they can't do 100% market rate housing. Um, so this is a way in which the city can use the planning powers, doesn't cost them anything. In a way, it's cheaper to do this way. And then, as I mentioned, the example of The Hague, um, there are cities that know the developers play the game. They try to lobby the city to get, a smart, uh, you know, to get higher densities allowed, to get more market rate housing allowed, all these kind of things. Basically, it's a way for them to make more profit. But if cities can play this game as well, they can say like, okay, if you're not willing to cooperate with our plans, we, we can change the zoning. Uh, or we can say in an existing zoning plan, um, we're not gonna make all of this available for urbanization, there's gonna be a park right there. And I don't think there's enough municipalities using the power in these kind of ways and saying like, okay, we play the games that you wanna play with us. Um, so I think it's, it's, of course it's true that developers take a gamble and they take risks, but uh, if they're not willing to do it, um, that's fine, then the, pri the price will just lower to a certain amount where there's someone else will step in. Mm -hmm. If they want to sell off their land and say like, okay, I can't develop, I can't make a profit, the land price will have to drop and someone else will buy it when the price drops enough. We can talk about it later. I, I, think, I think the general point I want to make is that as planners, we tend to think of developers as the enemy 
and we need to look for the common ground. Well, I mean, as, as a closing sentence before the last uh, obstacle before the, the aperitivo is going to be Marco Project Coordinator is going to wrap up. But I mean, like, actually, this last intervention made me think, you know, the, for, for many times, uh, planners have been assessed with being strategic, with being proactive, etc. Maybe because, you know, in the post industrial age, we were feeling that not many things were going on. So the planner's role was to activate things, to attract investment, to make things happen you know, stimulate regeneration, whatever we call. I mean, we're clearly in an age of uh, whatever you want to call it, urban development, capitalism, where things are happening. The land is definitely the uh, battlefield of development, of economics, of finance. So as a planner, I would say, we need to go back to basics and we need definitely more land use regulation, old style command and control and blueprints, because this is definitely a way we can do things happen in the way uh, that are better. So, I mean, I, I may be a bit old-fashioned here, but so I would like to ask Marco to, in five minutes, no more than that, maybe better three, to wrap up this conference. Okay, I'll try. Uh, so, I think that it was interesting uh, double lecture because uh, I think that we, we heard about uh, uh, few important general trends and uh, and, uh, and and that's I think is useful uh, and by the way I think that uh, uh, Manuel was uh, was very much right when he said you know it's it's not just about uh, listing differences and similarities but the important thing is then what you do with that okay and we and we heard uh, about many general trends and it was curious because actually many of the things that you said uh, both of you were actually mentioned during the, the, the round table that we had. For example, uh, planning departments in city that are basically creating money. That's something that Elena Rosetta said she was standing here. Okay, Or that uh, uh, cities, as a general trend, they became weaker because they had more, responsa more responsibilities and they have, uh, <coughs> while they have an equal or declining amount of, uh, of funds, to 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 live up to those responsibilities, and uh, uh, and I think that also another interesting thing that we also uh, that was also said during the roundtable is that cities in many cases are really struggling to to catch up, for for example, with finance because uh, uh, a finance expert bring a, f a financial product to, to, to the city government, the city government has no idea what it's talking about. Okay, and uh, this is something that also uh, applies, for example, to technology. We had a lecture here by Evgeny Morozov and he said something like this. So, uh, yes, everybody's talking about big data. Actually, public authorities are the first and foremost collector of, of data but they don't have the same kind of firepower that Google has or that Airbnb has. So they, they, have, they collect a lot of data, but they don't, really don't know what to do with them. So. And, uh, and also, uh, in terms of general trends, I think that uh, Manuel was uh, really effective in showing how uh, this is also an issue of how logic and practices uh, that are originally coming or are being have been developed in the private sector, the financial sector, the big tech, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are also spreading and invading uh, the, the realm of city government. Okay, so uh, they try city governments try to to catch up in a sense, being uh, uh, more efficient managers that the managers are, uh, but they're doing so they're doing the same thing uh, worse. Okay. While sh sh they should be probably do the, the good thing that the city administrations have learned during centuries to do, and for example, revive something that is uh, nowadays out of fashion, like exercising planning power in a way that you know benefits the local community and not just gi give gi give uh, things away to to, to developers and, and so on. So, and there are scholars that are discussing that there's br there are bringing these. The, this argument even further discussing about uh, talking about everyday liberalism, for example. 
how not only city government, but we as individuals, we now, uh, it, of course, this is a very general statement, but we are uh, very much into that market, uh, neoliberal logic, so we're not buying a house uh, as our fathers would do just to live there, but we're considering I its potential as an investment, even if we're living there, <laughs> which is pretty absurd in, in a way. So there are many reasons for despair, I think. Uh, this w the weakness of many cities, the subordination to, to logic that are inherently uh, different to the ones that benefit the, 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 the citizen, uh, and so on and so forth. So, how to find hope, I think, because, well, if you're not pessimistic nowadays in Europe, I think you're an idiot. Uh, it's pretty clear <laughs> that uh, this is 100% this is the case. If this means that you're desperate and you're paralyzed, I think you have no heart. Okay, so there is, we, we have to find some kind of balance between, between the two. And there are reasons to hope, and I think that uh, Ivan's lecture was mainly about the reasons for, for hope. I would add something, you know. We think we are very unlucky that everything is, uh, is wrong and bad uh, around us, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I would invite you to look back to like uh, three, four, five thousand years of human history, and you will find that, you know, you know, histo human history is bleak. I don't think we have special rights to get it easy. Uh, in a way, and so we have to realize that this is the condition. A lot of people are actually much worse off than we are, okay? The second uh, reason to optimism is that even in the, in, in the, the bleakest time in this uh, like, uh, neoliberal middle age that we're living, and it's not even that because even worse things are, 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 you know, crawling from under the carpets in Europe, uh, I think that uh, one reason of optimism is, uh, is the fact that uh, uh, someone uh, has not uh, given up yet. Okay. Someone like, for example, Ivan, people, uh, people touring you know, tens and hundreds of cities trying to find what works, trying to, 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 to fix, maybe one, fix cities and our societies one neighbor at a time, one, one EU grant at a time, but in the same time, not losing the, the, the big picture, okay? And so I think that we really, we really need that. Uh, and I think that uh, I also share, you know, uh, Ivan's hope for cities and, uh, and the EU. Because uh, uh, I think that it's, it's, really, it's really clear that uh, now we're seeing a whole uh, building of uh, representative institutions that has been uh, has been built in uh, in decades, uh, and especially after the Second World War, in a way, all all of this is now crumbling. Okay, and if the general picture is shaking, I think that a general rule is the that uh, you need to start bottom up, start starting small. Okay, networking, scaling up. And in this, I think that the European Union could be helpful, okay, uh, to trying to, to connect uh, the cities. Cities that have certain inherent qualities, I think, in terms of the culture they're producing, uh, the knowledge they're producing. Uh, cities can be, have specific power that will be difficult to, 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 to strip them off uh, in the next future, and also, uh, if you think that you're part of a, a more or less enlightened minority, well, minorities do not run countries, but minorities can run cities, I think. And uh, so this offer you a sort of, uh, of, of, uh, of platform that is maybe easier to, to control and to use uh, for, for to build a better world uh, that we all have in mind. And, uh, well, I think that it's, it's pretty clear that uh, every victory will be extremely hard won. Uh, it won't come easy, but there is no other option. So, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> it was a great conference. And uh, we'll see it for the next final conference of the next project, I think. Maybe, maybe sooner, I think. So. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you, Manu. Thank you.